guest, uh, Max Holland, has written a book called Leak, and that's why you're here. And Leak uh, raises questions about the motives of the alleged uh, deep throat, Mark Felt. And was he indeed a patriotic whistleblower? Or was he a self-centered, ambitious bureaucrat who was more interested in the dictator or in the directorship of the FBI than the presidency of the United States? And here to discuss that is Max Holland. Max. <laughs> Good evening. I'm greatly appreciative of the invitation to speak at the Nixon Library because, of course, this is the place to talk about Watergate. And I imagine there's a high hurdle that one has to achieve to be invited to speak here about that subject. But if you had buttonholed me 40 years ago and said that in the year 2012, you're going to be speaking at the presidential library of one of the two candidates running in the 1972 election, I would have sworn that we'd be in Rapid City, South Dakota, tonight rather than Yorba Linda, because I worked for George McGovern in 1972. That was the first year I was eligible to vote. Now, in my partial defense, I was for Richard Nixon in the 1960 election solely on the grounds that he was a Republican and Abe Lincoln was my big hero. But in 1972, I was working for McGovern in California, <clears throat> low paid volunteer position. And after the election, I kept a, a bumper sticker on my McGovern bumper sticker on my car for months afterwards as kind of a protest, a personal protest against the results. Mm -hmm. And naturally it was an article of faith to me that Watergate was much bigger, much more important than was understood at the time of the election. You have to remember that Watergate was hardly a campaign issue in 1972. McGovern tried to make it one, but it just never resonated with the public. There was a sense that this is just what normally goes on between the political parties, and if it isn't that, the president could not possibly be involved in something like a break-in at the Democratic National Headquarters. <clears throat> now, in, in admitting my political past, I'm trying to make a serious point, too, which is I did not write a book about Watergate to exculpate President Nixon from the serious legal problems that he encountered or exonerate him. My sole purpose was to tell what I came to believe was an untold story and let the chips fall where they may. If it changed the view of Nixon during Watergate, so be it. Now before getting to the nuts and bolts of my book, uh, I actually want to talk about another anniversary, because this month, next month's the 40th anniversary of Watergate, but this month is the 50th anniversary of a movie called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Now, it's a fair question, what would that movie possibly have to do with Watergate? It's John Ford, black and white, a film starring John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, Vera Miles, and Lee Marvin as the outlaw Liberty Valance. I would maintain the movie has a lot to do with Watergate. And this is the reason why. The movie tells a story. <clears throat> it opens with Jimmy Stewart, an aged Jimmy Stewart, with his wife Vera Miles on a train back to a small town in the frontier west. And um, a reporter is traveling with them, and he wants to know why are they going back to this small town, because Jimmy Stewart was a US senator, why are they going back to this small town in the frontier west to honor an obscure rancher that you know didn't amount to much of anything? And so would, uh, Jimmy Stewart starts to tell this reporter a story. 
And the story is that he came to this frontier town as a young lawyer, and he quickly ran afoul of the town outlaw, Liberty Valance. And eventually, he got involved in a duel with Liberty Valance. And Jimmy Stewart, you know, practically didn't know how to use a gun. Yet he shot and killed Liberty Valance. And it was that act that when that territory became a state that made Jimmy Stewart first a U.S. Senator and then an ambassador to the court of St. James. And in the same way, he won the hand of the woman, Vera Miles. <clears throat> but he tells the reporter, to the reporter's disbelief, that he actually didn't kill Liberty Valance. It was this rancher, John Wayne, who was also in love with Vera Miles, but knew that the future of the West belonged to men like Jimmy Stewart as opposed to his uneducated self. And although they loved the same woman, he didn't want to see Jimmy Stewart felled by this terribly mean outlaw, Liberty Valance. So after Jimmy Stewart tells this whole story, which is told in flashback, we're brought back to the train, and he says to the reporter, are you going to print the truth? I've told you this whole story. And the reporter has been assiduously taking notes the whole time. And to Stewart's surprise, he rips up the notes and says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. And that's kind of the same idea that I have about the Watergate scandal. Because the legend here is that two intrepid reporters, white-headed reporters, stood at one end of the street aided by a mysterious source named Deep Throat, and at the other end you had a black-hatted president protected by his minions, and the good guys win, the press wins. Truth, its only weapon. It saves the day, saves, the, saves our democracy. This myth was first presented in 1974 in the book All the President's Men. Subsequently, the, the book became a movie, and the movie made these three characters and the Washington Post editors, the three characters being Carl Bernstein, Bob Woodward, and Deep Throat, as yet unknown, icons, and uh, Ben Bradley also an icon as an editor. So that's what we're up against, this legend, which I submit is not the truth, is far from the truth, and the truth is far more interesting. Now, why did I become interested? <clears throat> um, in the summer of 1973, because of my involvement in the McGovern campaign, uh, I watched the hearings avidly. I was you know, one of those Americans who just stayed by the television. I had just graduated from college. I really didn't have a job, so to speak. I just watched television and watched those hearings. Um, rooting, you know, literally when, let's say, John Dean versus John Ehrlichman or appeared before the Senate committee. But after that, I really felt I more or less understood Watergate. I didn't read all the books. I'm not even sure I read all the President's Men when it came out. I did see the movie. My interest started again in 2007. This is now two years after Mark Felt has been identified as Deep Throat. He's sort of pushed into it by his family. And in 2007, the papers of Woodward and Bernstein were opened at the University of Texas. They had sold their Watergate-related re papers to the university for $5 million, basically because Carl Bernstein was broke. And I've done a lot of work in archives, and I know that there's always something in the archival record that is not known publicly. And I wondered, well, what are Woodward and Bernstein's papers going to show that we don't know about their work? And that was, you know, I came at it from that neutral angle. I just thought, there's probably going to be something interesting there. Almost has to be. So I wrote a couple of articles exploring the relationship between Deep Throat, what he did, you know, versus what Woodward said he did. Um, and another article I wrote was about the fact that Nixon, President Nixon, found out 
in mid-October 72 that Mark felt was leaking. He didn't know his code name was Deep Throat, but he knew he was leaking. And we can get into how he found that out later if you like. It's a complicated story, but Nixon knew. And I couldn't understand, given of course my perception of President Nixon, why he didn't fire the son of a gun right away. Or after the election, when he didn't have to worry so much, why he didn't fire him then. And that was the beginning of my reevaluation of Deep Throat. I accepted initially Bob Woodward's description of him, but I also noticed that it had shifted. In all the president's men in 1976, felt as a principled whistleblower trying to protect the office of the presidency, presumably from Richard Nixon. In The Secret Man, which is the book Woodward wrote in 2005 after Felt came forward of his own, uh, his own family's choice, uh, I noticed that Woodward had changed the description a little. Now Felt had leaked because he was protecting the Bureau as an institution against the clutches of the Nixon White House. So Felt wasn't so principled, it was more so you of your standard bureaucratic politics in Washington protecting my institution vis-a-vis -vis yours. And then uh, more recently, including in his oral history that Woodward gave to the Nixon Library, he kind of admitted, well, Felt was probably angry at being passed over as FBI director. Because what had happened in May of 1972, J. Edgar Hoover had died he had been the sole director of the FBI for almost 40 years by that time. He was the, you know, practically the only director they had ever had, really. And added to that, Felt had basically run the Bureau, because in the last two years of his life, Hoover really was, was not up to, uh, up to speed anymore. So Felt had literally run the Bureau. He expected the job would be his. And Woodward acknowledged that possibly his anger at being passed over for the appointment might have played a role in Felt's leaking. So he basically had this triumvirate of reasons, but um, none of them singly made sense to me for various reasons. Uh, the bureaucratic politics one in particular, I mean the idea that Nixon could remake the Bureau with one appointment really misunderstood the Bureau. I mean, the, the FBI is notorious in Washington as one of the most insular bureaucracies with its own culture, impermeable to outsiders, outside influence, and that grew up under Hoover. I mean, attorney generals who are the nominal head uh, supervisors of FBI directors had no say over what Hoover did. And the idea that Felt had to leak in order to protect the FBI against the Nixon White House uh, just didn't make a lot of sense to me. Also, I'd done a lot of work on the Kennedy assassination and I had developed, uh, interviewed a lot of FBI people and I knew what they were capable of the kind of shenanigans, the hardball that they play. Um, one of Felt's phrases to Woodward was there was a switchblade mentality at the White House during Watergate. Well, the place they really had a switchblade mentality was at the FBI. I mean, these are really hard-boiled men who will almost stop at nothing. The real impetus for me to write the book were the obituaries that appeared in December 2008 when Felt died three years after he'd come forward as Deep Throat. Um, the media really sought to bask in the reflected gro glory of the Washington Post coverage of Watergate. And the, there was a total lack of skepticism or questioning of course, when any Nixon appointee or White House or political appointee or the president himself spoke about Watergate, immediately there's skepticism attached to anything 
that they have to say about Watergate. But with Mark Felt and Woodward, it's complete and total believability. It's like the oracles speaking. And then a month after Felt's death, during a eulogy, Woodward seemed to retreat to his original, you know, pure and as the driven snow explanation of Felt. Mark's great decision was his refusal to be silenced. He was a truth teller. That's a direct quote from Woodward. Now, if there's one thing Mark Felt was not, it was a truth teller. I began the research, as I said, because I couldn't understand why Nixon hadn't fired Felt. I called up William Ruckelshaus. William Ruckelshaus was, for two months, the director of the FBI. Pat Gray had become the acting director after Hoover's death. Nixon had promised him an inside track to the job, but by no means was he sure to have the job. And after Pat Gray went down in flames, in 1973, Nixon wanted a very young man because he wanted him to be in there like Hoover had been at the Bureau for decades. And Ruckelshaus was a very young and capable man. He didn't want the permanent job, however, and he took, but he agreed to take it for two months in an, almost an emergency situation until President Nixon could find a permanent candidate. So I asked William Ruckelshaus, what did Nixon tell you when he asked you to be FBI director? Well, one of the things he told him is Mark Felt is a leaker. Watch out for him. And then Ruckelshaus told me, and I got rid of Felt. I forced him out for leaking. Now, this was news to me because if you read Woodward's books, all, it say, all, it, uh, all they say is that Felt uh, decided to leave the FBI to take advantage of the uh, better pension benefits. But in fact, he was forced out. He was forced out because he was suspected of leaking. Not only that, but Ruckelshaus told me that after Mark Felt came forward in May 2005, he had taken it upon himself to call Bob Woodward to tell him the circumstances of Felt's departure from the Bureau, because he thought would, would, be, would be writing a book, and he ought to know the truth about Mark Felt. Ruckelshaus also said that Woodward said, when he heard this story about the true circumstances of Felt's departure, well, this is very interesting and important. I'm going to make sure it gets out. Well, he has done nothing to get that story out, and I think there's a reason for that. <clears throat> the gist of my findings in the book is that felt leaked as part of the war, what's been called the War of the FBI Succession. Basically, for the last two years of Hoover's life, it was kind of like the Kremlin was during the Soviet rule. You had an aged leader, superannuated leader, and you weren't supposed to be too ambitious or appear to be overly ambitious because you'd get slapped down. But you were constantly maneuvering to be in the right place at the right time. And there were about three or four FBI assistant directors who when they looked in the mirror in the morning to shave, saw themselves as the next FBI director. And they were constantly maneuvering and felt was one of them. And he leaked to destroy, first of all, Pat Gray to show President Nixon that the man who was the acting director was incapable of running the Bureau and could not possibly be the permanent director. So Watergate, in this sense, for Felt, was completely fortuitous. Hoover dies unexpectedly. Gray is appointed, you know, uh, I mean, a colorless man, a, a dark horse. Felt believes the job is rightly his. Then Watergate happens about six weeks after Hoover's death. And of course, it's a very politically sensitive investigation. And yet, it is not a campaign issue. So that gives Felt the ability to leak details about the Watergate investigation, the FBI's investigation of Watergate, to the media and incite the White House against who? Pat Gray. And in fact, this all worked because there's one conversation between 
President Nixon and his Chief of Staff, H.R. Haldeman, in early August 1972, and the leaks have already started. And Nixon says, Pat Gray is clearly not the man for the job. He's not up to it. He can't control the Bureau. And Haldeman says, you have to put someone in there who really knows how to run the place. What about Mark Felt? I think if you put him in, he'll be your guy. Well, if Mark Felt had only heard that conversation, things might have been quite different because the next weekend, Bob Woodward comes to his house and they cement what became known as the deep back, felt it already leaked, but they, at that meeting, they cement what becomes known as the deep background arrangement, whereby Felt is going to give Woodward information about the investigation that he needs to corroborate, or he'll corroborate information that Woodward brings to him on a deep background basis. That means Felt is not to be quoted, He's not to be identified as a source. His identity is not to be disclosed to anyone. It's strictly a deep background arrangement. So most of my book is about why Felt did what he did, the war of the FBI succession. But I also found some other things that I didn't expect to. One is that Felt leaked as much to Time Magazine as he ever leaked to the Washington Post. Time Magazine never got the credit. It was a weekly. It didn't publish, uh, you know, it didn't have these drumbeat of stories. Uh, the Washington Post is uniquely influential in Washington because it's the newspaper that other reporters read. It sort of sets the agenda for what they're supposed to do. Their editors call them up, did you see you know, what the Washington Post reported? The New York Times, you know, this is a completely different media era, and the Washington Post was just on the verge of becoming a very important paper. But Felt leaked to Time Magazine, and the reason he did is, first of all, you have to remember that in 72, Bob Woodward, he's 29 or 30, he was practically a cub reporter. He'd only been at the paper nine months. He's a completely unproven commodity as far as Felt's concerned. He doesn't know if he can get his stories in the paper or where they'll be in the paper. He doesn't know if he can trust Woodward, and as it turns out, he can't trust Woodward. So he leaks to Sandy Smith, actually the more important, in retrospect, if you look back with perspective, the more important stories are to Sandy Smith. Sandy Smith is a much older, experienced reporter, famous for never talking about his stories. He had it written into his contract with Time Magazine that even if Time were sued for libel, Sandy Smith would not have to divulge his sources in a court proceeding, which I don't know if that would have held up, but that's what his contract called for. When he took calls from his sources, he'd leave the office and take them at pay phones. And he'd call his sources from pay phones. He was famous for that. He had made his reputation reporting on the mob in Chicago in the 40s and 50s. And it was said he knew the mob's pecking order basically better than the FBI. He would, if he knew a mobster was getting married, he'd rent the house or he'd run a room in the house next door so he could, you know, take pictures and write down all the license plates. So he's, now he's an unknown reporter, but back then he was famous. He was Seymour Hersh's uh, mentor or model. Um, <clears throat> so that was another finding in my book that felt leaked to Time Magazine as much as he ever leaked to the Washington Post. Felt had no intention of forcing Nixon's removal. He didn't foresee that ever happening. I mean, President Nixon was his ticket to becoming FBI director. He didn't understand anything about the cover-up, and if, you know the cliche that the cover-up is worse than the crime. He was leaking details of a politically sensitive investigation solely that Nixon, after the election, would appoint him FBI director. Now, when I had this insight, which I thought you know was brilliant, one of the things that I was interested to find was actually, if you look back at the coverage in 1973, you'll see 
hints of what was really going on. This is from a story written by a New York Times reporter named John Crudson, who later went on to win a Pulitzer, just never had as big a name as Bob Woodward. But this is what he wrote in August 1973. So this is a full year before President Nixon resigns. It's a couple months after Felt's been forced out of the Bureau. This is Crudson. Way, way, you know, it was like the next to the last paragraph in a story on page A18. A Almost from the inception of Watergate, federal law enforcement agencies, especially the FBI, have been accused of being the source of leaks to the press of confidential investigative information about the case. In some cases, sources have said, leaks from bureau agents were intended to prevent the nomination of Mr. Gray as the FBI's permanent director by signaling the White House that he did not have the respect of many agents and could not control them, and that if he were nominated, the bureau would, quote, leak like a sieve. Now, the only mistake in that story is that the leaks weren't from bureau agents. They were from bureau executives, namely Mark Felt. Now, the other set of findings in my book have actually more to do with Woodward and his use of felt. Because after, you established, to my, after I established to my satisfaction why felt was doing it, who he, what he was leaking, and why and when, I took a hard look at Woodward's reporting. Uh, one of my findings, actually it's a corroboration because I'm not the first person to say it, was that about one-third of what Felt told Woodward was misleading, if not outright, outright lies. You have to remember, he didn't really care about what the truth was. His goal was to incite the White House. And if the Washington Post story, uh, the Washington Post published a story that was a preposterous but inciting lie, that was as good as if the Washington Post published a story that was the truth, which was very embarrassing to the Nixon administration. But Felt didn't care what the truth was. And he was only interested in inciting the White House and also to the extent, an extent Democrats in the Senate, because he did anticipate the possibility, which he thought was slim, but he did anticipate that Gray just might receive the nomination. So some of his leaks were actually in anticipation of the day that Gray would be testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now to um, be charitable to Woodward, I think he was flummoxed by Felt. Certainly Pat Gray was. And a lot of people in the Nixon administration were Richard Kleindienst at first was told that Felt was leaking. He confronted Felt and Felt persuaded him that it wasn't, that Felt wasn't leaking. He would never think of such a thing. Pat Gray also confronted Felt after the president learned that Felt was leaking and felt persuaded Pat Gray that it wasn't him. So I think uh, it's probably fair to Woodward to say that he too was fooled into thinking that Felt was his, his ally in the search for truth in the fall of 1972. But I also think that at some point in the 40 years since, Woodward had to realize that that was not accurate. Probably, I would say by 1992, that's when the FBI released its Watergate files on the 20th anniversary of the scandal, and Woodward writes in The Secret Man that he went in and read them. And at that point, he would have to realize that a lot of the things that he was told by Felt were untrue, because if you compare what Woodward was told by Felt with what the FBI was saying to itself, things don't mesh. Felt is telling things to Woodward that he could not possibly know because the FBI doesn't know them. Now maybe he got them from somewhere else, but he's telling Woodward that he got them from the FBI. At the same time, contemporaries, 
contemporaneous FBI documentation shows the FBI didn't know that. So how could Felt be possibly telling him that Woodward that? So I think by at least 1992, Woodward would have to know better. But of course, by that time, you know, he's built up and inadvertently, I think, built Felt up to be this major principled figure and he's sort of caught in a dilemma. Either that or Woodward is extremely obtuse and I don't think that's the case. Now I want to touch on a sub-myth to this big story which is that Woodward and Bernstein protected their sources. This was a you know standard issue among journalists that you know you'd probably you'd have to waterboard Woodward before he'd possibly disclose Deep Throat's name. What people don't realize, and when I came to understand it, I j it's like the emperor with no clothes in a way. <clears throat> what really happened is that in the fall of 1972 with the election, the, the Watergate story really petered out. And so Woodward and Bernstein signed a contract with Simon & Schuster to write a book, the true story, you know, what they couldn't put in the newspaper. It was supposed to be one of these journalistic quickie books, you know, come out within a year before people forgot what Watergate was. Um, so then they take some time off from the newspaper in the March of 73 to start writing the book, and suddenly Watergate explodes. And all of the Nixon administration's denials come back to bite the administration because everything they had said, non-involvement by the committee, et cetera, et cetera, proved to be untrue. And a lot of this happens, incidentally, when Pat Gray comes up for his confirmation hearings because he is completely ignorant of the cover-up that went on, and he thinks he's doing the administration a favor by testifying honestly. Did you talk to John Dean about the course of the investigation? Oh yes, he was conducting an investigation for the president, so I told him what we were finding and when. When the senators heard that, they just you know went bonkers, and so did the press. So Watergate suddenly explodes. Woodward and Bernstein are writing a book about Watergate. But how do you write a book about Watergate when every day you open the newspaper and Watergate goes off in this, that, in a different direction? Now Robert Redford had become interested in Woodward and Bernstein because Redford was fascinated by their coverage at a time when most journalists had treated the break-in as, you know, standard practice in Washington. But what attracted him to the story was sort of the Mutt and Jeff nature of these two reporters. You know, completely, you know, Bernstein on the verge, literally, of being fired from the Washington Post before Watergate, and Woodward, who was considered this, you know, hopelessly square, you know, sucking up to the editors when most of the reporters were, had beards and smoked marijuana of his age. So you had this Mutt and Jeff, and that's what attracted Woodward, I mean, uh, Robert Redford, and he wanted to do a movie, not about Watergate, but about them. And so there was this encounter in the spring of 1973, and Woodward's expressing his frustration. How are you, you know, we can't write the book. We think we're gonna have to return our advance. How do you write a book where every day there's a new ending? And Redford says, well, why don't you write the book about what interests me, which is not the scandal per se, but how you guys wrote about the scandal. And that's when the nature of what came to be known as all the president's men, the whole axis of the book changed. It wasn't, no lo it wasn't any longer a book about Watergate. It became a book about them. Well, how do you write a book about yourself writing about a story? You have to disclose your sources. So they went back and talked to almost everybody they talked to. Can we write about you? Can we say you know, what we got from you and when? And a few people uh, agreed, you could as long as you don't use my name. Uh, 
One person who was pivotal, Hugh Sloan, allowed them to use his name. He was the uh, treasurer at the committee to reelect the president. But one person who was instrumental did not want them at all to use his name, and that was Mark Felt. He said, hell no. The deep background arrangement still holds. You're not to quote me. You're not to tie me to particular stories. You're not to identify my existence. <clears throat> but what was good, what was an, ar an arrangement for the Washington Post was not an arrangement that Woodward kept when writing for Simon & Schuster. He violated, in all the president's men, nearly every stipulation of his agreement with Felt. The only thing that he kept secret was his name and exactly where he worked in the executive branch. Otherwise, he violated nearly every clause of their agreement. And so the idea that Woodward you know, kept his end of the bargain, it really, you, can, you know, maybe you could do this 40 years after, you know, you've retired, everybody's, most people, most of your sources are dead, you could identify who gave you what and when. But they did this within two years. And it was, from Felt's point of view, a complete betrayal. And of course, he was petrified at the idea of being identified, because he knew that if he were identified and it became clear what he had done and when, that the why would also become obvious and that none of these ideas of a principled whistleblower trying to protect the FBI could ever withstand scrutiny. And that's the reason he stayed in the shadows for so many decades. Not because he was bashful or he was uh, too embarrassed to come forward or too modest. It was because he knew that he would be exposed for what he had been. Now the last finding uh, in the book really was probably the most troublesome and this was when I compared the passages in All the President's Men that Woodward conveyed about his meetings with Felt, because in the book, violating the deep background arrangement, he quoted, there are pages of quotes from what Felt told him, you know, for particular stories. <clears throat> now, you could only do this after 2007 when Woodward's notes became available at the archive in Texas. You could look at what he wrote down, because according to Woodward, he wasn't actually allowed to take notes when he had these clandestine meetings with Mark Felt. He'd have to remember everything he said, then race back to his apartment or the newspaper and then type up everything he could remember. So you have to allow for a little slippage. But when you compare the two, the contemporaneous notes against the account and all the president's men, a couple things become apparent. First of all, in the notes, he'll use quotes around particular phrases like switchblade mentality or other expletive, uh, I won't repeat. In the book, everything Felt says is a quote. Now that's kind of iffy from a journalistic point of view. What he also does is he completely rearranges the order of what Felt says to make it much more coherent. The notes, you know, veer all over the place and when the meetings are conveyed in all the president's men, it's a much more coherent, you know, back and forth explanation. So that, that's another liberty. Sometimes the meaning is changed subtly. For example, in the notes, Felt said that the plumbers, the plumbers being the people who perpetrated the burglary for the most part in the Watergate Hotel uh, office complex, um, were created to make leaks as much as they were to investigate them. And in the book version, the opposite is said, that the plumbers were really created to investigate leaks, not make them. But in the actual notes, Felt makes like the plumbers were, you know, putting stories in the media. And one example he cites is this Eagleton story, Thomas Eagleton, was the temporary nominee of the Democratic Party as vice president. And there was a story about his alcoholism that surfaced in a Jack Anderson column 
before Eagleton was forced off the ticket. And Felt says that was, has all the earmarks of a E. Howard Hunt operation, Hunt being one of the plumbers. Well, it turns out, according to Anderson's own papers, he got that story from Eagleton's Democratic opponent in the primary in Missouri years before. It didn't come from the plumbers. And so this is another example both of Felt telling Woodward an untruth, something he doesn't know, it is untrue, and then F and Woodward also you know, turning its meaning around. But probably the most disturbing example has to do with what was called the Canuck letter. You know, the Democrats' capacity for self-inflicted wounds in 1972 was boundless. I mean, they lost the election. It wasn't anything Nixon really did. It was what the Democratic Party was going through at the time. But there was this letter ostensibly written by someone who had heard Ed Muskie, who was considered the strongest demo potential Democratic candidate, that Muskie had used this slur, referring to his main constituents as Canucks. Well, first of all, Canuck isn't a slur, it's kind of a ter term of endearment. You have a hockey team named the Vancouver Canucks. But putting that aside, Muskie uh, went to the steps of the new um, Union, Manchester Union leader in the, during the New Hampshire primary, and he got all upset about this letter, which had appeared as a, a letter to the editor and the union leader, and he denied ever saying it. He would never talk about his main constituents that way. And it was partly seen as the reason why he didn't do as well in the primary and then became a non-candidate very quickly. <clears throat> so there was this, when all the supposed dirty tricks started surfacing, this was considered one of the prime examples, the Canuck letter, which destroyed the Muskie candidacy. And in Woodward's account of his meeting with Felt, they're talking about dirty tricks. Donald Segretti, who was hired to perform um, these antics to annoy the Democrats. And Woodward's getting a little frustrated with Felt because he needs specifics. He can't just write about generalities in the newspapers. He wants specifics. Give me a specific example of a dirty trick. What about the Canuck letter? And in the book, Felt is quoted as saying, it was written within the grounds of the White House. Or that's basically the quote. Written within the grounds of the White House. Is that good enough for you? Well, if you look at the actual notes of that conversation, there's never a discussion of the Canuck letter. There's not even a paraphrase about it. There's no reflection that a question was asked or answered. So what that means is that Woodward is quoting directly something Felt supposedly said that is not even in his own notes. And as it turns out, when the Watergate special prosecutor investigated the Canuck letter for you know, possible violations of campaign law, they found the Nixon White House had nothing to do with it. On top of that, when the FBI analyzed the issue, Felt couldn't possibly have told Woodward that the Canuck letter was written within the grounds of the White House, because at the time the FBI knew absolutely nothing about the Canuck letter based on their own internal documents. So these findings raise a lot of questions about Woodward's reporting. Now I want to make one final distinction before we get to questions, which is I'm a reporter or a journalist by trade myself, and as much as I've been critical of Woodward and Bernstein, I'm not actually criticizing, for the most part, their coverage during the summer and fall of 1972. You know, newspapers are not exact. They make errors. As anyone who works in the government knows, or anytime you read a story about something you know about, you, you see how bad newspapers can be. So I'm not really critic. I think I would be the first to acknowledge that what they did in the summer and fall of 1972 deserves all the kudos and acclaim it's received. The problem is the book. 
the book telling the story of what they did because that's where the fairy tale starts. The fairy tale about why Felt did what he did, the fairy tale about what he told them, the fairy tale about what he didn't tell them because another aspect of this is what Felt knew and didn't tell Woodward. And the prime example of this is Alfred Baldwin, who was the lookout at the time of the break-in and notified the burglars when the police cars arrived at the Watergate office complex. He was talking to the FBI within three weeks. He fled the scene, went back to Connecticut where he was from, and within three weeks he had spilled his guts to the FBI and he became the prime witness at the trial of the burglars. Felt never told Woodward about Baldwin. The first story about Baldwin that used his, I mean the first account that appeared about Baldwin appeared in the Los Angeles Times. So if Felt was really intent on getting the story out to the American people about the Nixon's, White, Nixon White House's illegalities and uh, uh, subversion of democracy, why didn't he tell Woodward about Baldwin? That's the kind of question, too, that you have to ask. So what does this all mean? At the elementary level, it fills a void in the middle of the story because, as the late Christopher Hitchens put it, Deep Throat represented the single most successful use of the media by an anonymous, unelected official with an agenda of his own. As long as we didn't really know what that agenda was, there was a hole in the middle of the story. Now we know what that agenda was. What does it tell us? First, it puts the role of the media in proper perspective. As I say, my hat's off to Woodward and Bernstein for their coverage in the six months of 1972. But they didn't break the Watergate case. If by that you mean the cover-up, not the crime. All their coverage, if you go back looking at it, is that you know there are higher-ups involved in the, or knowledge of the burglary. None of it is about the cover-up. The cover-up, which is what really fells President Nixon in the end, that all occurs in 1973 and Woodward and Bernstein are just two other reporters covering up. They didn't break it. The people who broke it were the prosecutors, the three original prosecutors of the burglars, who steadily increased the pressure on the burglars until one of them wrote a letter to Judge Sirica and said that perjury had been committed during their trial. And John Dean and Jeb Magruder then quickly broke ranks and fled to the prosecutors to tell their stories. And that's how the whole thing came apart. So knowing what Mark Felt represents, I think puts Watergate in the kind of historical perspective that is way overdue. Finally, it's kind of a cautionary tale because although the media landscape has changed Markedly, since the 70s, we no longer have three all-powerful TV networks, and we almost don't have newspapers anymore. Um, it still shows that officials with subterranean agendas in Washington can influence media coverage and change what we ought to know. The editor of the Washington Tonian Magazine put it best, the forces at work behind the scandal, known as Watergate, tell you an awful lot more about how things happen in Washington than the scandal itself. I'd like to end my remarks and take your questions. Thank you, Max. Thanks very much. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet uh, two special guests. Max's sister, Leija, and her husband, uh, uh, Martin Nicholson. So please stand and acknowledge them. <laughs> he, 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 he brings a portable fan club. Now, if you will raise your hands, I will come to you, and if you would state your question on the microphone so 
everybody can hear it. We'll take a few questions. Anybody? All right, well, I, oh, all right, here. Hi, my name's Carol. Um, I'm just wondering, how does the Felt family feel about your book? Have you got any feedback? Um, John O'Connor was the Felt family lawyer and um, really responsible for you know, pushing the family to put Felt in the limelight. And so far, I haven't heard from the family. He did make a remark that the book was interesting but terribly flawed. I think it was. Did you have? You didn't. No. All right. Did you have a question? I may. You may? I'm a formulaic. Oh, all right. Okay. okay, I'll go ahead. All right. Uh, you, you've. Uh, the context of the power of the bureaucracies, the FBI specifically, but other bureaucracies, I, I couldn't help but wonder what would James Q. Wilson have to say about what you're saying today? Well, um, that's a very good, interesting question. I think probably we would never see this again because it really was a function of an unusual situation and that Hoover, I mean a federal, I don't th can't think of another, another federal entity which was run by one man for so many decades. I mean there really was a cult of personality at the Bureau and particularly within what they modestly called the seat of government, namely the FBI headquarters in Washington. And this willingness by federal uh, FBI executives to leak, to destroy one another and not worry about, you know, its political impact or its impact on the administration. I think that was really an unusual once in a lifetime thing. I mean, these men who were competing for the job, they had all come into the Bureau when it had expanded markedly during World War II. They were all about the same age. They'd all been waiting patiently for Hoover to anoint one of them or the other. He wouldn't, he refused. And so when he died, and it was, you know, a shock that he died because he seemed like he would go on forever. It was a once, they saw it as a once in a lifetime opportunity and they would do anything to achieve that goal. So I, I don't think it's really applicable to bureaucracies. It's just, it was a very unusual situation. All right, here in the front row. Yeah, um, the short list for uh, everybody's choice for Deep Throat was Haig, the other guys. Could you, who were the other guys? Well, everybody was uh, mentioned at one time. I mean, Fred Fielding, John Dean's uh, assistant, Haig, of course. Haldeman named Felt because he knew Felt had, be, had been identified as a leaker. Um, David Gergen was identified once. Pat Gray was identified uh, by CBS. I mean, what happened is that when the book came out, felt there was this uh, interesting guy named Frank Waldrop, who was the editor of the Washington Times Herald, which had been bought up by the Washington Post in 1954 to give Post a monopoly on morning newspapers. And Waldrop had been its editor since like 1925, and he was really plugged in to the FBI. And when all the president's men came out, he was like this sage guy that reporters often consulted to try and figure out what was going on. He said it was Mark Felt. And Mark Felt was immediately identified as the prime suspect. And he denied it. And Woodward figured if he's going to deny it, deny it Woodward wasn't going to identify him any further. So then, as uh, you know, time went on, the speculation became more and more baroque and convoluted because of what Woodward had done to disguise Felt's identity. But you know, when it finally came, when Felt finally came forward, it was like the it was um, you know it was very deflationary because he had been the first suspect all along. <laughs> 
president of the Thank you.